How can Auburn become a top five team in recruiting on a consistent year-to-year basis? We'll go over that today on the Five Star Flex. Welcome to the Five Star Flex, where being a five star isn't just a ranking, it's a mentality. I'm your host, Philip Dukes, a.k.a. Dukes D. Scoop. Check me out on Twitter and Instagram at Dukes D. Scoop. And make sure you hit the like and subscribe button, of course. All right, well, today, Dr. Dukes is in his office, and my prescription, my diagnosis today is going to be for Auburn University, their football program, to consistently become a top five and sometimes top three team in terms of recruiting. I do have a PhD in recruitology, and I've looked at some things and inside the program where I see that Auburn under Hugh Freeze has made huge strides within the last two years. When you talk about how low the bar was set at recruiting during the Harson era and where it is now, the, the, the sky's the limit. But when you think about how do you actually get there, what does that roadmap look like? I just looked at a few points that I think that if Auburn could go ahead and just capitalize on, they'll be a force to be reckoned with for years to come. And not just those highly ranked recruiting classes where you get a lot of skilled players and no offensive line, or you get a lot of guys uh, who don't end up staying in the program. I think that if you can continue to recruit Auburn guys who come to Auburn for the right reasons, and there's a great blend of reasons why they come to Auburn, guys will be willing to stay, and Auburn will be able to build the culture where Auburn is the cool place to be. All right, so the first step in my prescription for getting Auburn to a consistently top five program, you're going to have to maximize the staff on field and off the field. Now, Hugh Freeze has put together a staff that is very unique in the blend of veteran leadership and the the amount of young guns he has on staff. So when you look at it, you got a guy like, let's go with Charles Kelly. Charles Kelly, a bit longer in the tooth. He's he's one of the, the, the best recruiters. And you can on, honestly say he may be one of the best recruiters ever when it comes to the amount of players that he's coached, the amount of players that he's recruited, the type of players that he's put in the NFL, and how they all still come back to confer with uh, Charles Kelly. So he's one of those guys. And you look on the, the flip side of that, you got a guy like Marcus Davis who just landed one of the best recruiting halls in Auburn history when it comes to a single position group, the wide receivers coach. When you landed a guy like Cam Coleman, who was number one in the state of Alabama overall, which is a huge victory for Auburn. We'll get to that a little bit later about how big that really was. Then you got a guy like Perry Thompson. You backfill those guys with a Bryce Kane and a Malcolm, a Malcolm Simmons. And you talk about one of the best classes that has ever, a four position group that has ever graced the campus of Auburn University. So when you've got a guy as young as Davis and, and a guy who as who is as tenured as Kelly, there's a unique blend of recruiting prowess that have come along that you say, man, if we could just capitalize on it. So you got some staffs that are going to go super young and you got some that are just going to go straight veteran leadership. That blend is something that I think that Auburn could really focus on. So also when you talk about veteran leadership, you talk about a guy like Crime Dog, Wesley McGriff, who's who's been with Hugh Freeze for a long time. He's been to Louisville. He's been to multiple places, and he's always been successful. When you're able to put those two guys together in the secondary, where you got Charles Kelly and McGriff in the same secondary, it's almost going to be like they have so much experience that they're especially recruiting the same type of players where there's going to be so much cross-pollination between the cornerbacks and the safeties that they're going to be able to lend that leadership out to guys who may not have been in a lot of these SEC wars for as long as they have. So when you think about a guy like Jake Thornton, who came from Ole Miss, but he's still a bit younger. When you think about a guy like Josh Alders, who may not have as much experience recruiting in the SEC, but still did a heck of a job last year and landing guys like Joseph Phillips, uh, Demarcus Riddick, and not, and DJ Barber, like he, he still put together a heck of a class as he as they as they continue to learn from these veteran OGs, so to speak, in the game. You can just see how that can really be a, a blend or or a cocktail for success when it comes to being able to relate on both levels: the football level, the cultural level. Uh, also, being able to say we're going to develop you. Also, being able to be able to put your arm around the guy. Now, that's something that. I really value in recruiting 
is when people have a genuine feeling and, you, and if something bad happens, do you feel like this coach is willing to put an arm around you after he curses you out? And I think Auburn has guys in place that if they can maximize these guys, that blend that they have on the field, they're going to be set for a long time. Now, when you talk about off the field, Auburn made some really, really good additions off the field this year. One being uh, Kenyatta Watson, who's really, really connected in the city of Atlanta. I I've heard his name for years and years. And just knowing that, especially in the Gwinnett area, um, when you talk about the Graces, the Park Views, the Brookwoods, these are guys, these are schools that you have to be able to get into, Peachtree Ridge even. And Kenyatta Watson is, is, is basically a VIP on that side of town. He has a lot of plugs also on the southern side of town where I'm from. I've heard his name multiple times, seen him around. So I think that was a huge hire, especially coming from Georgia Tech. And he had some experience in Florida State too as well. So he was a huge hire as far as building that pipeline back from Atlanta to Auburn. When you talk about a guy like Will Redman from LSU, who I'm hearing is a master strategist, who's been able to make sure that guys are in the right places at the right time with the right information when it comes to briefing coaches, when it comes to understanding what recruits are going to need when they are on campus, how to make the experience the best. Now, when you got a campus like Auburn, which is already full of tradition, full of lore, full of people, full of vibrance, and you're able to structure each recruit's experience so it's tailored to them where they are able to pull their own part of Auburn out. I think that's important. And from what I'm hearing, Will Redman has been really instrumental in figuring out a lot of the information, the background info, and how to structure visits and how to make sure you're getting the numbers game right when it comes to how many official visits you have versus needs for the base of the roster. And a guy that's going to help him do that, and that does do that, and who did a pretty good job doing that last year as well, is A.K. Magula. I think I'm saying that right. I'll just call him A.K. My bad if, uh, if I said it wrong. But A.K. is a guy who understands what is needed in order to construct the roster. When you talk about a guy who, 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 who when you talk about NFL circles who, when you talk about what's going on in Auburn, I've talked to multiple guys that have, have had their eye on AK and just said, hey, you know, he does a good job. And he's really good at what he does. And I think that Auburn is really lucky to have him. And when you talk about understanding the roster, how do players fit into each part of the roster? Or is this player a fit for Auburn based on my knowledge of what Hugh Freeze wants to do? Learning the coaches. And I think the off-field staff, when they, come, when they call them support staff, it's because you have to understand what it takes to support the coaches that are on the field and what recruits are a positive or are going to miss positively with what Auburn has going on. And I think that AK is, is, is a rising star and he'll continue to be there. And as long as Auburn can continue to highlight the, their off field staff, when it comes to Kenyatta, when it comes to AK and when it comes to will, they have really an all-star staff off the field that I think is going to really help them in the future. One last guy that you got to talk about is Coach Dom, the strength and conditioning coach. Really energetic guy, about his business. When he comes in, you, you there's a presence about him that lets you know that he's going to get you right. Coach Dom Stadinsky. Now, when you think about a guy like Laramie Tunsil, one of the top offensive linemen in, in the past 20 years in the NFL, right now he's in Auburn. And if Coach Dom was, in, was anywhere else, if he was in Kansas, Larry Tunsil will be there. If he was in Cali, Larry Tunsil, Larry Tunsil would be there. He credits Coach Dom with the sculpting of his NFL frame, where he was able to become such a dominant player. And so, wherever Coach Dom is, that's where Laramie's offseason is. And I think that speaks huge volumes into what Coach Dom has meant to his players in the past and what he means to his players now. And when players are able to see a guy like this, an all pro level guy who basically if it wasn't for some 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 BS, would have been the number one overall pick that year when he came out in the NFL draft. When a guy like that is singing your praises and not only singing them, but proving it by putting his time where his mouth is, it's easy to throw money at something. When you actually spend time to go places and stay there, I think that is huge when it comes to using that in a recruiting way. So if Auburn can maximize their off-field staff, 
along with the on-field staff and that blend of youth and veteran leadership, I think that Auburn can consistently compete for top five, maybe top three classes. All right, my second step that you have to do to get Auburn back to top five and top three classes consistently is to win Alabama and keep Clemson out of Georgia. Last year, Auburn did a good job by making by the, the type of haul that Hugh Freeze, and I feel like he did this very purposely, was to make sure that Auburn got back in Alabama the way they needed to be. When you look at the previous year, I don't think Auburn got one single of the top 10 recruits in Alabama. The following year, those numbers flipped completely, even getting the number one overall player in Alabama in Cam Coleman, and he almost got Ryan Williams. And a lot of people say, well, maybe Ryan Williams was playing Auburn, but he didn't have to play Auburn. I mean, he he flirted as much as he did because Auburn became a more attractive place. And if they would have had an earlier start, I think that recruitment goes a lot differently. But going forward, the type of talent that is in Alabama, you cannot have another season when you where you allow every one of the top eleven players in Alabama to go to another school. You got you can you have to get at least what Alabama gets at minimum. If Alabama gets five of the top 10 players in Alabama, you should have five. You cannot let Alabama win Alabama, the state of Alabama. Being so because it sets a cultural mindset that if you're from Alabama, that's where you go. Now, usually when it comes to the state of Alabama, recruiting boards at colleges are kind of similar to the rankings boards where it comes to on three or 24-7 or whatever ranking site in, in the composite. When it comes to stuff like that, you really got to think about how does Alabama continue to stay successful? They win Bama, right? And then they go pluck from different places and recruit with the national imprint. But they usually win Alabama. Well, Hugh Freeze came and put a stop to that last year. Now, this year he has an uphill battle when it comes to recruiting the state of Alabama. But if you can get a guy like Eric Winters, if you can get a guy, let's say you get Naeem Offer on campus a couple of times, he's committed to Ohio State. But if you can start to continue to get these type of guys on campus, Anquan Fagans, let's say you get an Anquan Fagans to commit to Auburn. Then you start to see a, a Jared Smith, a Zion Grady, a guy like Zion Grady, if you can get him to Auburn. Like, you got to split on these guys. And I think Hugh Freeze knows that. See, as soon as Hugh Freeze got to Auburn, the first places that he visited when he was able to go out was all of the commits who were in the state of Alabama because he understood how important that is to make sure you take care of home. Auburn has a very daunting task when you've got one of the most storied college football programs as your rival in state. I'm not sure, and in the same conference. I'm not sure anybody else has more of a daunting task when your two rivals are. Georgia, and Alabama. But Auburn can do it. And the reason being that as long as you set in recruits' minds in the state of Alabama that Auburn is the place to be, then you'll at minimum split. And I think if you can do that, then you'll continue to be successful and write a recipe for having a top five class. Now, the flip side of that is you got to keep Clemson out of Georgia. In years in years past, in the in the mid 2000s, in the 2010s, when Auburn was really good, they had a boatload of players that came from the state of Georgia. When Clemson became the school that got the four stars and and five stars from Georgia that didn't go to UGA, that's when they that's when you saw their rise in production. Think about this: Deshaun Watson, Georgia; Trevor Lawrence, Georgia. There is a long list of guys that usually, when they didn't go to Georgia, they almost automatically went to Auburn. Focusing on the state of Georgia is going to be so important with the amount of player, the, the amount of players, the amount of talent. And when you think about the proximity, the southern side of the state of, uh, of Atlanta, excuse me, the southern side of Atlanta, from the from downtown down eighty five, every part of that track from downtown to 85 is closer to Auburn than it is to Athens. So when you've got that type of proximity to that type of talent, you got to capitalize. So if Auburn can continue 
to recruit well in the state of Alabama and get back into Georgia and keep those guys who used to go to Auburn that have currently been going to Clemson, if you can get those guys back to going to Auburn to where Auburn is the secondary school in the state of Georgia, I think that'll be huge for, for continuously and consistently landing top five classes. All right. The next step of the prescription for Dr. Dukes, you got to continue to be aggressive with NIL, but judicious at the same time. But what do you mean, Doc? The Auburn's collective has become one of the top six, top seven NIL collectives in the entire country. And this is talking to guys who from NIL agents and also members of other collectives. They are very well aware that Auburn has that the Auburn NIL collective on the victory has become a major force in recruiting. Now, how can On the Victory, which is Auburn's collective, continue to capitalize on a positive momentum that they've had? Well, one, you cannot, they, On the Victory has to do their research and understand who's getting what and why. Now, there isn't any contact between the coaching staff and the collective when it comes to negotiations of, of all of that. They have to assess market value on their own. And I think that by using information, doing your research, talking to people around different situations, getting football people on board in a collective, you'll be able to be judicious when it comes to making sure that players are getting the right amount and you're not just throwing money at a problem. So, for example, Auburn will not get the development discount of the NFL that uh, Alabama or Georgia would get or Ohio State even would get because they haven't put the same amount of players in the NFL in the top two rounds over the past four or five years that those schools have. So you're not going to get that discount where a recruit may say, you know what, NIL is important, but I'd be willing to take less money to go to a school that has a proven track record of first-round picks recently. So by – understanding is like, okay, we may have to pay a little more in NIL to get these top rate guys in the next school. But understanding that casting a recruit, uh, casting a recruiting net so wide and so broad that you, that one player is not going to make or break your class and understanding the difference in the both. I think that'll be huge to be just as judicious with the NIL as you are aggressive. Now, Auburn has a bag. And the collective knows they got a bat. And other schools know they got a bat. And word spreads. And Auburn hasn't missed any payments. Excuse me, Auburn's collective hasn't been missing any payments. And you have rumors of schools that are saying, what well, a school promise, what well, you have rumors of other schools with collectives where they say, this collective promised me this, but I didn't get it. Well, you haven't heard that story one time at Auburn. And all you heard is positive things about Auburn's NIL collective. So, I think that if the NIL collective can continue to be judicious by putting the money in the right places as well as aggressive, you'll see a blend of where people know you're going to get paid the right amount of money if you choose to go to Auburn from the collective. And I think that it's important for Auburn not to just throw outlandish numbers at certain positions or players so that when you've, you've raised all of this money from donors and they want to see, and I don't care how much money they have. Everybody wants to see ROI, a return on their investment. So by putting the NIL dollars with the right players and going up or down, however much that money is, by being able to land and put it in the right places, it's just like the NFL. If you spend bad on a free agent, you're in trouble. MLB, the Yankees, they throw money at everything. But if they put it with the wrong players, they're in trouble. And the same thing for Auburn. It doesn't matter how much money you raise. If you put it with the wrong players and you aren't judicious with your NIL, it'll turn out bad. I think Auburn's NIL collective has done a great job of putting the right dollars with the right players. And if they continue to do that, you'll see Auburn consistently remain in the top five when it comes to recruiting. All right, the next step of the prescription is you got to start early and be consistent. When I say start early, there were so many guys that say that Auburn was late to the party. Now, when you look at the prior regime, there wasn't there like there was a junior day with maybe 12, 13 people there, which was unheard of at the time for an Auburn junior day. 
Big Cat were some of the was some of the weaker Big Cats that you've seen. Which and Big Cat is the huge recruiting event in late summer before the season, where you're usually going to get a big commit or you're going to have a lot of players, and it kind of puts Auburn on people's mind going into the season. Well, those were two of the of the Junior Day and the Big Cat in the previous regime were two days that were kind of wasn't good at all. So. Now that Auburn has kind of revived their recruiting when it comes to getting people on campus, they've got to continue to start early. So the way that those events that were lacking in attendance affected Hugh Freeze is because in some of those events, you're going to have guys who are freshmen and sophomores who basically that's going to be their introduction to Auburn. Okay, so that previous regime, when they didn't start early, it affected the new regime or the current regime because the freshmen that used to come to the games are now juniors. The sophomores are now seniors. And so now they didn't get that early experience when it came to Auburn. They didn't get to go to those games. They have no idea how crazy Jordan Hare can be with 90,000 people running around with their hair on fire. So when you don't have that early start, they are, that, that space in those recruits' minds goes to other schools that say, hey, come on up, you know, or come to the game or, or or come take a visit to our to our campus while they're formulating their basically their mind of where they're going to school from an early part. So Auburn has been facing an uphill battle a lot of the time when it comes to some of these very high profile recruits. You look at the KJ Bolden situation. Auburn came right here to get in KJ Bolden, but they were of his top schools. They were the last to offer. Ryan Williams, when you look at, hey, what happened with Ryan Williams, they were one of the last schools. Ryan Williams literally was on Auburn campus and nobody said anything to him. They didn't start early enough. So I think that Coach Freeze and staff and this new staff, they understand how important it is to start early. Now we are at a point where now that they've been there for a while, the statement that you got to focus on the current class in order to compete. That starts to go away because now you've landed a great class. Now you've had your real kind of first class where you had your hands on a program the whole time. So that first class is, has come and gone. And so now you got to start building for future classes as well. So I think by starting earlier and removing yourself from behind the eight ball by contact, by contacting player as early as possible and making sure that they get on campus, I think that's going to be huge for Auburn consistently landing top five classes. So just to just to summarize that, you got to start early. And the last thing you want is for guys to consistently say Auburn was late or how, and guys who follow recruiting, especially Auburn fans, I know you probably got sick of hearing that. Oh, well, Auburn was late to the party. They didn't offer me early. So if you can get your evaluations to a point where you're starting to get offers out earlier in the process and get Auburn on guys' minds, it, it shouldn't be Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, then Auburn. It should kind of be right now for how recruiters been going. Auburn should be first or second when it comes to these top flight guys as long as they fit the program. And I think for more guys who end up being some of those really, really highly prioritized recruits, I think that Auburn will start to get in earlier, and I'm starting to see evidence of that already. All right. The next step, and we're almost done here, the next step in the prescription to get Auburn back to top five classes and top three classes will be get them to Auburn, get them to Hugh. If you can set Auburn's atmosphere up, if you can stay in it long enough to get people consistently coming to Auburn, families, recruits, if you get them, there is something special in Auburn. You talk to multiple recruits, it's like a lot of them can't put their finger on it, but you got to get them there in order for them to see it, and preferably in a game day situation. If you can take care of A day, let them see a little bit of it then in the spring. Last year, A-Day got, got bombed by bad, by bad weather. But I think this year, as long as the weather cooperates, this will be a big A-Day for Auburn. If you can get guys on the campus where they can feel that Auburn spirit, I think it's one of those things that you really can't describe. But it's something that is a heavy factor in players that do commit to Auburn. It's the atmosphere. 
they always talk about the family atmosphere. It's just something intangible in the air that comes along with Jordan Hare Stadium. One thing that coincides with getting players to Auburn is getting players to Hugh. You got to get guys to Hugh Freeze to close. This guy's a closer. If you ever talk to him, if you ever hear him talk, he he's the type of guy that he could be selling you something and you feel like you're getting a deal, even if it's way overpriced. It's the way he talks to you. It's the way he looks you in the eye. It's the way that he he you really feel it. He's a guy who's been through some things and doesn't shy away from those conversations, but also is saying it, it gives him an air of humanity. A lot of times when you talk to college head coaches, there's an arrogance that precedes them where you don't feel like this is a guy I can talk to or I'm having a problem at home, coach. Hugh Freeze makes you feel like if I send my child to you, my child is going to be taken care of. And if I can't get on the phone with my child, I know you will if possible. And those are the type of things that go along with Hugh Freeze and why he's been successful at the rate that he has when it comes to recruiting. So if you can stay in the battle long enough to get him to Auburn and get him to Hugh, the closer, Coach Freeze, the closer, if you can get those guys to consistently come to Auburn to games and to consistently have conversations with Coach Hugh Freeze, I think those are two of the best things that Auburn can do in order to be sure that they consistently put together top five classes. All right, last but not least, but this is probably the most important, you got to provide proof of concept. In the fall, you got to do it on the field. There has to be some type of proof of concept. I'm not saying Auburn has to go out and win 11 games this year. What I am saying is there has to be some improvement. you got to eliminate the bad losses. Imagine how different last season looks in Auburn if you don't lose to New Mexico State. Just think about that. It, it kind of changes the entire season a little bit. Reason being, you almost beat Georgia. You should have beat Alabama. And when, you, and when you're talking to a recruit, you can honestly say, hey, look, I needed a player like you in order to make this work. If I had somebody like you, maybe this play works better. Maybe this play doesn't happen. Maybe we complete this first down, you know, things of that nature. And that's what you got to sell to recruits and no disrespect to the players that are on campus. But you have to, your, your aim has to be to upgrade the level of talent. And the aim of players on campus has to be, I'm not letting anybody come take my job. But if I'm a recruiter, I'm selling those games. But you got to eliminate the bad games. See, you don't want to have to talk about New Mexico State. Because nobody wants to come in on this high level. Four and five star guys who are used to winning don't want to come in and talk about losing to New Mexico State. You got to find a way to win that game. The same way that Alabama, I think it was South Florida early in the year, they found a way to win. And this is not being comparative to Alabama as a whole. What I'm saying is good teams find a way to put away bad teams or not even bad teams, teams that don't have the same level of talent as you do. So New Mexico State was a well-coached team, but they they had nowhere near the talent that Auburn did. So in order to have players continue and families continue to trust you with high-level talent, you have to win those games where you're the more talented team. Like you can't lose those games, especially when it comes to recruiting, because those guys want to know that if we're more talented, we're going to win. And I think that's something that's very important. But like I just said, the next part of that is you also do get to capitalize on the fact that you were this close to beating Bama and Georgia last year. I mean, this close. I mean, if the talent level would have been a little higher, if, if I'm a coach, I'm saying, hey, if we could have surrounded some of these guys that we have that made plays in these games with a guy like you, we win that game. And both of those and both of those games really came down to a few plays. So if you've got, if you can tell three or four, five-star, four-star, really, really talented guys that, hey, all I needed was a play from you, one play from you, one play from you, one play from you, and we win both of those games and our whole season is different. That's a really good pitch. And I think that recruits are really going to be open to hearing that type of stuff. And I think as long as Auburn can provide proof of concept on the field, now, eliminate the bad losses capitalize on those tough losses, right? And the last thing you got to do, 
Coach Freeze, you've taken over the offense. you got to figure out how to pass the ball. If Auburn can get that air attack back to where it used to be, or you can see some of the similarities between what Hugh Freeze was able to do at Liberty, what Coach Freeze was able to do at Ole Miss, where you're airing the ball out, you're taking some pressure off of your defense because you're not going three and out, you're making more of a threat vertically so you're able to run the ball between the tackles and be multiple in your offense, if that can happen, I think that you're going to be able to attract top quarterbacks. I think that you're going to have more receivers that want to come. Right now, you are set up. You've got one of the best young receiving cores, and they say Cam Coleman is everything that he's been built to be already. If you can get one of these quarterbacks, a top one, one of these uh, Longstreet, Lewis, somebody, if you can get a younger quarterback to come in and guys to know that this offense is going to work, because right now it's probably a little hard to sell the vertical attack when it comes to looking at film from last year. But next year, I mean, if you can really go out here and put together a solid offense, especially vertically, I think that'll bowl very well when it comes to Auburn consistently competing for top five classes starting this year. Well, there you have it. That is my prescription, Dr. Dukes. That is my prescription for Auburn University to become a consistently top five and sometimes top three program when it comes to recruiting. And I think if they can really put all of this together, you'll see a, a, a continued uptick in Auburn's recruiting. Right now they stand number 10. I fully think, I really do think that Auburn can become a top five team this year when it comes to recruiting, especially if they take care of everything that I diagnosed and prescribe for them to do.